My guy, Sohil Var, welcome to the podcast, bro. We've been meaning to do this for quite some time now, like I said before. Two busy men on their mission, but um, I think now is the right time to do it. You guys were just crowned champions, which you'll tell us about. But, uh, I mean, really respect what you've done and what you continue to do. And, you know, you're a great influence to younger guys and girls, so I wanted to have you on the podcast, share your story. So, yeah, if you could just begin, for the people who don't know you, just introduce yourself. I appreciate you, bro. Thanks for having me on. So, quick intro. Sohil Var, pro footballer in Dubai, 24 years old, uh, right back, playing with Golf United FC. And we just got promoted from the UAE second division. Crazy season. We'll get into that. But to recap everything, started at the lowest level of competitive uh, right when I entered high school in Canada. So started quite late, but then just grinded and grinded and worked hard and kept climbing the, the ladders to make it up to this point. And along that journey, also just documenting everything on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube to showcase people what the process is really like, all the behind the scenes that people don't get to see. Absolutely, bro. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, if you could take us through, you know, when you started playing, uh, where, you know, your youth development and then kind of through the ranks to your first professional contract, and then we could get into some bits and bobs, but just to show them the journey, that would be great. For sure. So crazy roller coaster. I'm sure like every other football player, but if I had to sum it up, so basically, I was born in Austria, Vienna. I'm Iranian, so Iranian parents, but was born in Austria, grew up there, and I, I had a year of playing uh, football there. And then what happened was we moved to Canada. And when we moved, I had just broken my leg on a ski trip. So we came to Canada, and my first two years, it was just recovering from the fracture, trying to integrate into a new culture. And so I didn't really play any type of soccer other than recess at school and then at 14 was when I joined that competitive club it was the lowest level at the time then worked my way up step by step to when I was about 16 17 I knew I wanted to go pro had no idea about what it took had no network no connections parents were big on education so the route that made the most sense at the time was let's go to college university soccer get my education and play there so i joined carlton university had a season there i got cut a uh, big surprise moved to a different university and then that's when i decided to take the leap went overseas on trials i was in austria played a season there i was in germany on different trials just did the whole traveling from city to city trying to make it happen then COVID hit then crafted an opportunity in Spain, took the risk to go to Spain, try and make it happen there. A lot of ups and downs. After that, went to Dubai, and Dubai was where I was able to sign that pro contract and just came off an incredible season. So very grateful and happy to have been able to share the journey with everybody. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounds like, you know, your journey was kind of meant to be. You know, I think that's how, honestly, how life is. You know, you... You go through the ups and downs. You learn from the, quote, failures, even though I don't even like to call them failures. You learn from your mistakes, what you did, you know, what you did wrong, what you did well, and then you, you keep moving. And obviously, you know, you use that momentum, that forward momentum to get you to where you're at right now. But as they always say, they don't see, you know, people see, you know, you guys move from the third tier to the second tier to the first tier, but they didn't see the struggles that you went through, you know, getting cut from your university team. So can you take us back to that moment, you know, uh, when you joined the university team, what position were you playing? Did you see any success within the team? And then why do you think the coach cut you? Yeah, so going back to that stage in high school, that's when I took things a bit serious. I would go before high school, train on my own, after high school, train on my own, because I was looking at the best players in the city. And, you know, like in every city, as you're growing up, you kind of know who the best players are. And I was not part of that pack. So I knew I had to put in extra work to try and make my way up there. And I remember going to university. I had two friends who were part of that pack. And I asked them, like, what are you guys doing next year? And they said, we're going to be with Carleton University. And they played with a club that had that internal connection. So they basically recruited all the players from that club mm -hmm. to be able to be rookies at Carleton um, University. And I didn't have that network, didn't have the connection. So 
I emailed the coach. I found the coach's email at the time, shot him a couple of emails. Basically, he said, come to the open trials. Uh, I knew open trials, they're not really going to take anybody. So I was persistent, kept emailing, kept emailing. He got back to me with two things. He said, February 2nd, 4 p.m. And this was grade 12 year in high school. And I showed up, basically it was an invite to come train with the team. And he gave me one session. Mm -hmm. And I go, I do the session. At the end of the session, coaching staff talks with me, says, hey, you did good today, come back. So I come back, long story short, I keep training with the team. We do preseason, we do training camp, and I'm the last signing on the team. So obviously coming in as a rookie uh, into college university soccer, I didn't really know anything. But physicality and speed of play, big, big step up. So my first year, I was very technical on the ball, but physically I was far behind from everybody else. And especially the coaching staff, they really favored physical players that year. So my rookie season, I actually only came on for one appearance in the season. And I think we got knocked out in the quarterfinals. So after that, mm -hmm. a bunch of the seniors left and the coaching staff sat down with the rookies, especially. And I remember him telling me like, next year's your chance. You're going to come in, you're going to get more minutes and this is your chance to integrate. So all winter, I work incredibly hard training camp. I go out there. He's saying I'm in contention for the starting 11. So feeling good preseason. I'm scoring two goals, but I am coming off the bench, which I was a little bit disappointed of, but I said, okay, let me get on the team. I'll integrate. I score two goals. And what happened was the day before the season started, they need to trim off two, three players from the roster. And we all kind of thought like, okay, you, you know who those players are. But what happened was mm -hmm. I went into the meeting and they said, we've decided not to make you a part of the roster this season. And I remember I was just so shocked in that moment. I didn't know what to say. It was, it was the four coaching staff in front of me. I just, I got up, I shook their hands and I left. Went to the locker room, told the guys, nobody could really believe it. And at that time, that was a very difficult time because I had a roadmap of what I'm going to do in terms of climbing up and trying to get to that pro level. And that roadmap just got destroyed right in front of me. So in the moment, extremely difficult. The upcoming months were basically, I had set my whole university schedule around my team trainings. So now I had this crazy schedule and I didn't even have a team training environment to be in. And it was months and months of, I would go to class and every single time I would come back, I would make a stop at the field. And I would go to the field just by myself and just do shooting, just do dribbling, just try and pass the ball off of somewhere. And just keep training and keep training and keep training. I did that for a couple months. And at the same time, I would be sending emails. So that's the time where it was kind of a blessing in disguise. Because for me, it was like, okay, Ottawa, not really going to happen. Let's try and make it happen somewhere else. And that's where I sent emails and emails and emails. And eventually got myself a trial in Austria eight months later. But that's pretty much kind of zooming in on that situation of getting mm -hmm. caught from the university team. So that was definitely one of the difficult mm -hmm. moments of the journey. Mm hmm. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm sure that feeling in your stomach or your chest was just different level. How did you, you know, was your instant reaction? Okay, I'm going to use this as dark side motivation to to get better and to, you know, find that next opportunity. Or was it, you know, kind of feeling bad for yourself in a sense? Or was it just like, okay, I'm going to use this to my advantage, use it as fuel and and, and find that next opportunity? Because, like you said, you know, um, a lot of a lot of disciplined guys, a lot of disciplined individuals have have plans, you know, and, and they have a roadmap. But like you said, not everything, you know, and what I'm sure you realize now and what we all realize is it's not all a straight path. It's not always going to be perfect. There's going to be bumps in the road. There's going to be highs and lows. So so how did you kind of perceive that that talk, you know, uh, and how did you kind of flip the switch in a way? So I made the commitment. I'm going to make it to the level. I'm going to, I'm going to push for pro. So in the moment, it was definitely difficult because the roadmap was destroyed, but I did use it as fuel. I told myself, okay, these guys don't believe in me. That's fine. Football is a game of opinions. I'm going to go to the field every single day, two hours, three hours, going to put in work consistently over time, improve. And you don't want this to fuel yourself consistently over time but you can tap into it at moments and it's this dark energy of proving people wrong like proving the people mm -hmm. who never believed in you and that moment for me i don't know if it was quite that day when i got back but definitely in the coming weeks 
I tapped into the energy of I'm going to work harder. I'm going to, I'm going to show these guys that I am going to be able to make it to, to a very high level. And so I definitely tapped into that. But a quick side note on that is, you know, sometimes things happen and then you get super motivated and driven and you think you're back on track, but boom, another setback hits you. And basically the week following when I got cut, there's another university in Ottawa, Canada, where I grew up and their soccer team is not in that top division. So they're in a division that is significantly lower skill level, like straight up. And I decided to go try out with them because I wanted to be part of a team. And because I wasn't with Carleton anymore, I had decided to transfer universities because I was only with Carleton for soccer. So I -hmm. went to that university that was a lower division. And one week later, that university doesn't take me either. It was like open trials. And so imagine like you're in this, you're in the elite university college level in Canada and you get cut. And now you're going into a level that's significantly lower. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, at least I'll be like the best player on this team and I'm going to play. And at the open Mm -hmm. trials, I remember the guy just walking by me. He was selecting his last two, three picks and he just walked by me and he didn't pick me. So that those things start messing with your mind. And I think that's, that's where the persistence and the mental toughness comes into play. It's the after five, after 10, after 20 no's, Are you still willing to keep going and realizing that then it might be another 20 no's? It might be another 100 no's. It might be 100 trips on the train, 100 trips on the bus ride to try and make it out to those environments to finally secure that contract. And that's what I truly believe makes the difference between those who go on to achieve great things and those who don't. Those who don't, they take a swing, they take 10 swings, 30 swings, and they give up. But those who do go on and achieve great things, they're willing to keep pushing. So uh, definitely tapped into that dark energy, but still a lot of setbacks uh, in the following weeks after that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What you said is gold. You know, um, first of all, I want to touch on the fact that you said, you know, you committed to the choice. So I want to talk about commitment and then I want to talk about persistence because like you said, I think for me, I just made a video the other day. I think persistence in no matter what you do is the most uh, underrated and the most powerful word in the dictionary, because, you know, once you finally make that commitment and you actually make the commitment, you look yourself in the mirror and you actually make that commitment. If you're willing to persist and keep on going and keep on drudging forward, no matter what, you know, you're going to be successful. You're going to make it. And so what I want to ask you is, what how old were you when you made that commitment of i'm going to play pro and what what did you kind of say to yourself what was the commitment when you said that when you fully were on board and and dedicated to doing it because you and me both know there are a lot of people who say they want to play pro but it's easy to say that but taking those actions and especially like you just we touched on the hard times are the ones that really test you. Um, what, what was that? So for me, the time frame was at the beginning of high school. I think every young boy, they have that dream when they're like six, eight, ten years old. Like, I want to go play pro football. You see the World Cup, you see the Champions League. But there comes a time where you either commit and you take it serious or you don't. And for me, that timeline was around the beginning of high school where I knew I really want to go pro. And the the thing I told myself was, one, I I knew I had a deep passion for the love in the game. And two, this is the deeper purpose behind it. I really wanted to, knowing that it's something that I have a passion and and deep love for, I know I wanted to be really successful in that category and everything that comes with it because I wanted to help out my parents. And that was a big, deep purpose for me. And you nailed it with the with the point about commitment is like commitment and persistence go hand in hand. And the deeper and the stronger your commitment is, the deeper your purpose is, the more of the setbacks you're willing to go through. So the more of the the knockdowns you're willing to. So every time you get knocked down, you know, you start asking yourself questions. And if you don't have strong answers to those questions, you're going to stay on the ground. Because when you get up, shit gets difficult. You're going to get knocked back down. 
So if you have a deep enough why and a deep enough purpose, you're willing to keep going up and, and getting up and, and keep staying persistent and moving forward. So for me, in my mind, it was I knew I had a deep love and passion for the game. And I wanted to tap into the highest level of my potential. But then also, if I'm being honest, the deeper reason behind not just football, but a lot of other things I do in my life, too, is because I really want to give back to my parents and my family and and create an amazing life for them, seeing like them having to to immigrate to Canada and, you know, all the difficulties that they had to go through. I could talk for hours, but that's something that fuels me. So that's a quick message. I also want to just give to anybody listening is do a quick audit right now with what is your why and dig deeper. Don't just, don't just settle with that first answer. Dig a little bit deeper. I love the game. Why do you love the game? Get to the second answer, get to the third answer. Once you get five levels, seven levels deep, that's when you start tapping into a fuel source that will get you past the 100 setbacks, the 200 setbacks. And for me, that's my fuel source. Absolutely. Yeah, I love that, dude. That That's so well said. And, you know, I, I think, you know, tons of footballers, you know, have to, have to, like you said, they have to do that. You know, David Goggins always says it, that live autopsy. You got to dig deep and you got to find what your true why is because, if you go for the superficial things of looking cool for your friends or looking cool for Instagram, looking cool for social media, that ends really quick. And if you could really, like you said, tune into that why and remind yourself every day, I even try to advise youngsters to write that why, put it above their bed and look at it when they wake up, look at it when they go to sleep, and then come back to it when the training gets hard, when their body's sore, when their mind is tired, and just constantly reminding themselves why they do it. You know, common saying is if you know the why, the how is so much easier. So just like you said, that lays out when you have that why, it lays out how you're gonna do it because that that's the bigger purpose. And I think it's, you know, so beautifully said that you you dedicate it to your family and the people who brought you into this world of why you wanna do it. And and that's it's the most powerful thing, you know. And um yeah I, I i really love that man i really love that yeah so after after uh after you when did you decide that you wanted to make the jump over over to austria uh and and how did you just for a lot of the youngsters listening what was your you know i know you've shared it but what was your tactic on on how you were networking to get those opportunities so i decided to make the jump over after i got cut from the university team that's when I started sending a lot of emails. So I'll, I'll, I'll take the, I'll go step by step. So what I did first was mm -hmm. I looked at the country and I researched all the different league systems. And so I looked at the first division, second division, third division, fourth division, fifth division. I went down to the sixth. I'm like, just get me in there and I'll grind and I'll work my way up there. But every single country, likely in the first division, second division, Again, it depends on the country, but you'll have like a national level competition. Um, and then as you go down, it starts breaking into regions. So I was aware of all the different regions, all the different clubs. And then what I did was I researched every single club and I looked at what city are they in. I looked at what players do they currently have. And a great website for this mm -hmm. is TransferMarked. You can get all the information on those website on those websites. And once I had that information, that's when I then decided to do the creating connections and reaching out to actually get a trial. And my process for that was at the time sending a lot of emails because I knew all I needed was one yes in terms of getting a trial to get myself there in person to then do networking on the ground. So basically, I spent months Suck. and months finding those emails. And the way I did that was go on club websites. Sometimes they'll have emails of specific people. Sometimes they'll have the general email and you'll have to reach out to the general email and try and get the contacts of the specific people you're looking to reach. Nowadays, I also use different platforms. For example, Instagram is a great platform where I'll find sporting directors of clubs and I'll DM them. LinkedIn is another great platform where you can find super valuable people in the football space, not just coaches and sporting directors, but 
uh, the chairperson of a club, the CEO of a club. And those people can often connect you with the right person. So I sent out emails for months and months, and I finally got that one yes. And by the way, before that yes, it was a lot of, I just want to paint this picture. It was like sending out 10, 12 emails every night. And sending out emails takes time. It takes time to find the emails. Once you have a template, you kind of send off that template. But finding the emails is pretty difficult. And when you open the laptop the next day and you don't have a new email sitting in your inbox, that is demotivating. And when it happens day after day after day after day, that starts taking a hit. But again, it's going back to what we said. Are you willing to keep sending out the next email? And I got the yes eventually, about two months in. And the yes was a trial secured with, at the time, SC Schwarz in the third division in Austria. And this club was like mm. a village. It wasn't even like a main city in Austria. And I said, you know, all I want is the trial. And I actually managed to get a, a trial accommodation for the week and food. So it was great. Um, but I took the, the flight I had to pay. So I took my trip over. I did the week over there. And that's basically what kick-started my journey in Austria. It didn't work out with the club. Uh, but I had to keep going for a couple of weeks to make it work. But that's basically how the, the first trial came about in Austria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that, bro. Uh, first thing I want to touch on, and then I want to go back for some practical stuff. But I, I, I think the first thing that all young footballers listening to this is you got to get yourself over there. And so he'll mention the number one thing is getting yourself on ground. And I, I say that all the time, because when you're on ground, then it's so much easier. You get yourself a phone card and you're like, I'm here. I'm in Austria. Can I just come train? And it's, it's so much easier for these club directors, these sports directors and these coaches. Oh yeah. You know, tell them to come down for a couple of days and we'll see if we like him. And I don't know about you, but my approach, you know, and my advice to youngsters now is, Instead of asking for a trial, just ask if you could go train, you know, and then if you're good enough, when you're good enough and you have a good impact on the group, they're going to be the ones offering you something. So I feel what I've experienced when traveling and doing this when I was younger as well is when you ask for a trial, the cl club starts to get a bit stressed. Oh, you know, does this guy have a European passport? How much are we going to have to pay him? Uh, accommodation, transportation, does he know the language? And if you just go in and you, you provide them and you say, you know, let me just come train. I'm already on the ground. And then you're there, you prove yourself, and it just takes a lot off of the club. And you're not, in a sense, a burden to the club. That's what I've noticed, you know, has, has worked for a lot of players to get their foot in the door. And I think what you said as well is you just wanted to get your foot in the door and kind of use it as a springboard. So what would your advice be? Uh, to youngsters, I mean, you, you just you gave it all to us. But in terms of the approach when emailing clubs or calling or calling clubs, what would you say? How would you kind of craft that email? You know, yeah, uh, just to add to what you said, I, I think that's an excellent way of going about it. And I've actually made that transition about when I went to Spain, like two years ago, that's when every message actually was more so, can I just come out to a training session? opposed to can I get a trial because it's a lot more natural and it's a lot less stressful for the club to take you up. So at the time in 2018, I did ask for a trial specifically, but nowadays I would actually recommend asking for a training session. And okay, so let's talk about the email. My template is, again, you have to, you have to craft it differently depending on the region and the club, mm -hmm. but it's something along the lines of, hello, you know, coach, whoever you're talking to. My name is Sohel Var. I am a, you know, 24 year old right back currently playing at this team in this division. I am currently looking to advance my career in Europe. And I believe I can be a positive addition to your squad for next season. I am currently in the city. Am I able to come out for a training session? Again, you got to tweak it a bit. Um, but sure. something along those lines where you're not necessarily asking, but it's coming more so of you, you provide value to them. Like the whole, I believe I can exactly. be an asset to you guys. I believe I can help you guys out. And all you're asking for is a training session. So they don't have much to lose at that point. And that template, I would 
actually also take into phone calls and in-person networking, which is currently actually what I prefer doing more than sending out emails. It's been a while I've Mm -hmm. sent out emails because I've noticed the in-person, which we've talked about, is so much more valuable. Actually being in person, once the the coach, once the player, once the sporting director, they get to see a face, they get to see your energy. I've noticed that to be huge. The the energy, the ambition of you wanting to be there, that is 10 times, 100 times more powerful than email. So similar format of approach, you always want to come from a place of how can you provide value to them. But definitely tap into two things. One, phone calls. And in Europe and a lot of different places around the world, other than like Canada and USA, WhatsApp is a, is a platform that a lot of people in the football industry use. So tap into WhatsApp and then also get yourself on ground and speak to players. I think it's very undervalued. I think we're just looking at coaches and staff members and they do make the final decisions. But players who are already on the team, they can often give you an email. They can give you a phone number. They can put in a word for you. They can get you out to a training session. And going back to my first trip over, that's actually what happened. The first club didn't work out, but I made a connection with two of the players at that team I was at, and they got me my next trial or my next training session the following week. And I kept doing that. Mm -hmm. And being in person and talking with players was super valuable for me. So anyone listening to this right now, even if you're a youth player, when you go out to tournaments, right? There's so many different teams. Go and start networking with other players. Go and get their social media. Go and get their number. Go talk to coaches because the in-person networking, majority of players are not doing it. So if you do it, your network's going to become stronger a lot faster. And the better of a network you have, the better opportunities you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that that's so well said. And I'm so glad you added the players in there as well because, you know, coaches will generally ask the player, you know, what did you think of this guy? What was the vibe? Because they can't, generally they're paying a lot of attention to the training session. So that's if you do come to the tryout and your friend, your buddy does help you get in there. But also what I want to add to what Sohil said is networking's a really big term nowadays in whatever you do, whether it's football or whether it's business. And I think Sohil said something that I want to clarify is make sure you're adding value, you know, if you're, don't just go up and, and look for something, make sure you're bringing value to them as well. And then don't just look to have them in your network, have them be a connection, be yourself, be, be real. Don't, don't put on any fake persona and just be a good person. And if you're doing a training session with them and you meet them in training, people are going to notice, you know, if you go on trial and I'm sure that's what happened with you, you go on trial to a club and you're there 30 minutes early, you're doing your activation, you're doing the warm up. you're positive during the session, you do your best to have the best session you can. Afterwards, you do your stretching, and then you just smile. You, you, you create that good vibe like Solil was talking about. You create a good aura. People could feel that. People could feel your energy. And when they want to be around you, people are going to want to help you, especially if you're a foreigner in a different country. So, yeah, I, I think that that's very valuable, and I think – one of the biggest things is just making sure that that network is, is a, is a friendship. It's not just, you're not just using them for a connection. You actually build a relationship and a friendship with the person. Yeah, 100%. I agree with that. It's also, like you said, building that relationship. So you have to maintain relationships and that's why I, I often try to, whatever connections I currently have every couple of weeks, every couple of months, just try and stay in touch with them, check in with them, see how they're doing, because you never know when somebody else is in a position where they can help you. And you never know when you're in a position where you can help them. So as long as you're providing value to somebody, um, there's going to be a time where they can then do something for you. And it's not about me doing something for you and you doing something for me, but it's growing together. And the best way to grow together is to, to keep supporting each other, like stay in contact with the connections you have and down the line, like you never know what could happen. You never know what position somebody could be in. So yeah, I definitely agree with the maintaining mm-hmm. relationships. For sure. And I want to add to that, actually, that just brought up a really good point. You know, a practical tip, to, in, in order to connect with 
with people and, and people always say, how do you stay connected? For me, one of the best things is holidays, New Year's, birthdays, what, you know, reconnecting and just saying happy new year. Hope you have a great new year. Or I saw you sign that contract there. Congratulations. I saw you guys just won that league. Congratulations. And, and I remember you always did that, man, because not a lot of my buddies do that. And I always won that was one to do that as well. So I wanted to yeah. say, you know, well done on that. And it, it stuck. Like, I didn't remember it right away, but w- once we brought it up, I remember and it stays in the subconscious. You're like, yeah, so he'll always, you know, says, you know, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, you know, happy new year. So that's something for, for, for people to keep in mind. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And the thing I just want to stress again, the importance of being proactive with that network. I think as a young kid, because I'm trying to put myself to like 14, 16, 18. And when I, when you're a young kid, like you're so scared to go and talk to somebody. <laughs> like you're so scared. Even when I went to showcases oh, yeah. tournaments, like I was a shy kid. I would never go, go talk to somebody. But I promise you, I promise you it's never as bad as it seems. It's actually quite the opposite. It's when you go and like take that first step out of your comfort zone and you go and introduce yourself to somebody, the feeling you get after you're so happy that you made that connection. Like, forget the whole, how can we help each other out? It's just just making the connection. Yes. Growing a football friend, growing a football connection. It's so powerful. And it's something I wish I did earlier. I've only taken it seriously in the last two to three years. But if any, like a younger person is listening to this right now, be I want the, the, the key word to be proactive. Like you have to go out there and do it because if you don't, it's not going to happen. So that's something I wish I did earlier is be proactive with my networking. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And to add to that and to compare it to something else, like, you know, you're never going to have regrets. You know, if, if you, what, what's the worst that can happen? And, and just to compare it is like, you know, if you're a male and you're looking to find a girlfriend, you know, what's the, if, if you see a good looking girl, you know, what's the worst that can happen? She's not interested. You could always be friends. So it's like, just go up, make the approach, and it, it's uncomfortable. You know, it's uncomfortable. But if if you make that approach, there's nothing really that, that can that can happen. And generally, most of the time, good things will come of it. Yeah, and just based off of experience, 100% of the time, any single situation where I hesitated and I didn't go up and make the connection or I didn't go and have a conversation, the thought of what if and the thought of not yeah. knowing what the – that's always going to be worse. Uh, than like the worst possible outcome of actually going up to them. So whether it's you're going up to a coach, a player, a girl, a a business, whatever it is, every single time I went up to them, regardless of the outcome, I was more happy with that than not going up to them. Because I always thought, what if? And if you think the price of stepping out of your comfort zone is too high, wait until you get the bill from regret because that bill is a lot heavier. Yeah. 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 I love that. I love that. I love that. Yeah, man. So let's get back to your journey. So after, after you, you were with this third league club and then you got help to another. So take us on that next club you went to in Austria. Right. So basically the club, the first week it went well, the conversation was, Here's what we can offer you at the time, which was very little money. We're waiting to secure our sponsors for next season to see if we can move you up. So it was on standby. And basically, I then spent another two weeks going to different clubs. Similar situation. One of the clubs, it didn't work out. One of the clubs, I performed well. I did get an offer, but just not exactly what I was looking for to sustain um, the move over. And then there was a break where teams, you know, summer break, there's no season going on. And then when the preseason started up, I heard back from those two clubs basically saying, hey, look, we're not going to be able to increase things. And at the time I had a decision to make, was it, do I go back to Canada or do I stay and keep trying? And I decided to keep sending out emails, keep sending out WhatsApp messages. And it was actually a WhatsApp message that got me my next opportunity. I remember it was June 25th. I got invited. The guy said, you can come train for a week. I went, I trained for a week. And what's crazy is I trained for the week and they offered me at the end of the week. This is what they said. Like, 
Uh, we already have our 24 guys signed for the season. Our budget is done. If you want to come on, we'll have you on for 200 euros a month. So obviously not ideal to be able to, to live. It was in Salzburg, Austria too. So quite an expensive city. Mm-hmm. But yeah. that week I was there, like instead of busing home, I asked for a ride home. And those three, four rides during the week, I made a connection with somebody who was already on the team. And they then got me connected with another club called SV Grudig. And so they were mm-hmm. able to get me the contact of that coach. I messaged, messaged the coach. The next week, I'm out to training with them. And this was a week before the transfer window ends. So I go, I train with them. I do the whole week. I do well. But it all came down to that last uh, session of the week, which was a preseason friendly match. And it's quite funny. I didn't actually know who we were playing at the time. Because everything happened so seriously in my mind. It was like, okay, preseason game on Friday. If I perform, I get the contract. And I show up to the stadium and there's this whole story of like, it was funny because I was living, I got this Airbnb in like the place across the stadium, but it was like on a highway. And I remember the meeting time was like 5.45. It was an evening match. And I planned it. So I get there like 20 minutes early and Google Maps was telling me to go a certain way. But then I start walking and all of a sudden I'm walking onto the highway and there's like three lanes, like high, like, you know how it is in Germany and Austria, fast speed. I'm like, shit, like I can't cross this highway. And the way around was going to be like a 45 minute walk. And I couldn't go late. This was like the match where they take me or they don't. So I actually decided to go, I I had to time it right. And I went went through the highway and I climbed the little wall they had and I made it just on time. And when I get there, I see a bus pull up. And it's Borussia Dortmund. So we ended up playing the B team of Borussia Dortmund in a preseason friendly match. Wow. And that was the match wow. that kind of made it or, or, or was done for me. And he played me at yeah. a right back, kept me there for 86 minutes of the game. The left winger contained him very well. We lost 2-1, but quite a good performance against a team of that caliber. And right after mm-hmm. the game, pretty much they let me know that they, they'd want to offer me a, a contract for the season. And so I actually went on to sign with them in the third division of Austria. And again, like that's how it happened. The season itself is a whole nother story of, of obstacles and challenges, but mm-hmm. that's how it came about is, is I just stayed persistent with things, got myself to different clubs and eventually it worked out. That's awesome. And you literally risked your life, man. <laughs> Yeah. Going across that road. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, that's what it takes guys, guys and girls. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, so how old were you when you signed over there? So I was, I think I was 19 at this time, or I was around 19. Mm-hmm. This was my first time going overseas. And yeah, so I had the I had the season there. And actually halfway through the season, a lot of things went wrong. One of the biggest things that went wrong was after the first three weeks, which went great. Like I made my first appearance. Mm. I played an OFB Cup game against an Austrian Bundesliga team. So to go from getting cut from university to then less than a year later being in that environment, in a in a like a, a, a high level environment with pro players, that to me was crazy. But then the following week in training, I have a grade three tear in my ankle, and basically ever since yeah. that happened, the recovery took like six weeks. Once I got back into it, just never really integrated back into that that like Mm. starting 11 that I was trying to get to. And then also this is a lot of things that people don't realize is like being in a foreign environment. It's not just football. You think, you know, you think like, Oh, it's football. Like all I want is football. I'm going to go play with this team. I'm going to train. I remember I picked this location where I had three beautiful natural grass pitches around me and three, four weeks in you get lonely. Like you don't really have friends. And that's a mistake I did. I didn't really have a social life at that time. I would decide to stay in a place that was not in a city. So I had no surroundings and it got difficult mentally. And that plus the injury six months in the CPL was starting in Canada. And I decided I had a meeting with the club, mutually ended things halfway through the season and decided to go and pursue the CPL because I also had a lead to get into preseason with two CPL clubs. And again, that's a whole nother story, but that's basically how that first first season in austria went there were a lot of a lot of challenges definitely like one of my most difficult time frames in in the journey Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's very well said and you know i'm sure you you learned so much from that 
But I, I think that's very valuable that you included is, you know, when you first come over to Europe or, or a foreign place, like you said, you just think you want football. But I was actually just giving the advice to this one Nigerian guy we just signed, you know, a couple of weeks ago. You know, you have to be happy off the field to be happy on the field. And I think that's something that we don't realize when we're younger. And, you know, guys like us, guys like Become Elite, 7 MLC, we want to provide that that mentorship and try to help these, these young people know the mistakes we made. So I completely agree with you. I was in the same boat when I was, when I was in Germany and I was 20, I was just, all I was doing was training and I didn't go out or have any social life for a year. And I was like, I got better as a footballer, but I was miserable. I was miserable. And you know what I realize now, and I'm sure you do as well, when I'm, more social and have more fun off the pitch. I'm laughing. I'm having more fun on the pitch. And it just, it honestly just makes you less stiff in your body, more loose, and you just enjoy yourself and you're more flowy and fluid on the pitch. So I think that's something really to, to not underlook, try to make friends. Like we talked about before, make real friends that have similar interests and ambitions to you. And also try to get your mind off football. You know, I think, I think that's very valuable. I think, you know, we think that we need to be 24 seven football, but I think you do have to have other things to take you away from the game. So when you come back to the game, you're fresh mentally and, and physically. Yeah. That's one big realization I had in the last two years too, is I've been going at this for like 10, 10 years now, 10 plus years. And the majority of that time, anytime there was a training session, a game, I would spend all day thinking about that session. And I'm sure a lot of people listening right now can relate. You, you're thinking about that session. You start getting anxious. You start getting nervous. You start overthinking. What if I make a mistake? Will I perform good today? And the like doing that over years and years, honestly, it made me really unhappy with football. And it was only in the last, this season has, I've made a great transition, but even like two years ago, I'm only starting to make the transition where I start incorporating things outside of football to get my mind off of football and not just off of football, but also onto other things I'm interested in because a lot of football players think I only like football. Trust me, there's other things that you like. There's other passions and other interests that you enjoy doing. And by tapping into those things, you're actually going to be performing better on the field because you get your mind off of the game and like you said, I've noticed I've been playing a lot more in flow and I've had a smile on my on my face when I'm playing and I'm looking forward to training opposed to being like anxious or nervous about it. And we actually had, they brought in Tiago Alcantara and Adrian into our oh, first team training. Yeah. And one of the things that they said after a training was that Tiago, for example, once he's done his training session, he actually has one or two interests that he goes and he does that for a couple of hours in the day. So he doesn't do football all day because if you do football all day, your mind gets overwhelmed and over time that's going to lead to burnout. So you want to have activities that allow you to deload from football. And then when it's time to get back into training and back into games, you're going to be a lot more fueled. So that's, that's something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I, I firsthand um, years of years of like being anxious, being nervous, and now finally, when I don't have football, I do the content creation to give back and make an impact. I, I go to the gym. I go hang out. I have a social life. And then when I'm back into football, I'm a lot happier and I perform a lot better. Yeah, that, that's so well said. And I, I think, you know, I've been thinking about it as well. I think there's two things. I think from the first standpoint, especially when you're chasing your first pro contract and you're you know, really serious about the grind and the hustle culture. One problem that I see with a lot of youngsters is I see that they think football is all or nothing and it's all they have. And I think one thing when you get into, you open your mind and get into different spaces, you realize there's more to life than football, you know, and, and people are, I, I've gotten the, the angry comments on my posts when I say that, for example, like some serious issue, even when Christian Erickson had that incident, I wrote, you know, health is more important than football. There's more to life than football. And I would get backlash. But what we don't realize is the number one thing is making sure we're healthy physically and mentally. And then, you know, there is more to life than football. 
We're, I'm not saying that that football is not our first love and how important it is. But when you do realize there's more, you put less pressure on yourself. And I think that's where the flow comes from because it's like you get on the pitch and it's like if you make a mistake or you have a bad session, or you have a bad game, it's not the end of the world. And when you can get that into your head, then you can actually play free and more confident. I think that's a very big topic now in the social media space in football is how can I become more confident? I, I do so well during team training. I do my ball mastery. I do my gym work. But when I get onto the field during games, I'm just stiff and I can't perform like I did in team training. And then I, I start to ask the, the people who are asking me that is, what are you doing outside of team training? How are you getting your mind off football? And I think, you know, I could say it from firsthand, when I was 20, you know, I'm a type A personality. I was just going after it six hours a day. Maybe I was very good technically, but I, I was stiff on the field, you know? And now as I got older, I was like, you know, football is not everything. And as I've gotten to that, I feel much better on the field and I actually have more fun. Yeah, I, I think in terms of fulfillment and performance, it's 110% the way to go about things. Like if you have interests and passions that you tap into outside of football, you're going to actually perform better on the pitch and you're going to be more fulfilled in life. And that's very important. I hear trust the process often, and it's so important to stay persistent and keep going. But I also, in my mind, I always tell myself recently is enjoy the process because at the end of the day, you're doing football for fun and for joy and for the love of the game. That's why we all started it. And as you grow and you try and push up the levels and you see the reality of things and the challenges start coming in, a lot of people, like a lot of high-level players that I know, they hate the game. They hate the game. And it's because they haven't made an intentional effort to enjoy the process. So performance and fulfillment, 110%. The third thing I want to add to, uh, this is also, it's a very practical a move for your career to add an interest or a skill that you do outside of football that can then help you both during your football career and then after your football career to build up your career. So whether that's coaching, training people, whether it's making videos, content creation, it, this can be anything, but those two categories, performance and fulfillment, it will help you there. The third thing is it's going to help you be a more skilled individual and you can make more income. You can tap into more networking opportunities. You can tap into more partnerships. So it's, it's a win, win, win. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that third point is, is major key. And, you know, I think you've done a great job with it. That that's what I, my goal was when I first started Rick fit is I, I always want to do something in parallel with the game, with the journey. And when you do that, it just, you're on that same route and what you do off the pitch, like we talked about, you learn helps you on the pitch and then it helps others on the pitch. So it's like, can you find that, that skill that, you know, is in parallel with your journey and doesn't intercept it? Obviously you can find other, you know, loves like art and stuff like that. I mean, I think that really is a great thing for, for footballers, you know, for, you know, things to get your mind off the game. You know, I remember I listened to an interview with uh, Hector Bellerin and he was talking about how he was always really into fashion and he would get a lot of hate from critics and pundits, you know, and that's the problem. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's getting better. But I think when footballers tune into a side hustle, especially when they're in the limelight, in the spotlight, and if they have a couple bad games, the pundits and people will always blame it. Oh, yeah. You know, Bellerin was focusing too much on the side hustle, which is why he's playing poorly. But that, that's not the reason. You know, that's just actually a way for him to get away from the game. So, um, you know, with, with that being said, you know, I want to go through the rest of your journey. But, you know, I, I really respect a lot of what you did in terms of showing, you know, the journey and the vulnerability you had to share everything on social media. So when did you start your content creation journey and, you know, how, how, did, how did you go about that? Content creation journey started at the beginning of high school. I remember I was watching Free Kickers, Joner Football, some, some of the, like the legendary guys in the YouTube space. Legends, yeah. And I was like, yo, like, I really like this. Let me get a camera and, and start making videos. So I asked my mom for a camcorder, got the cheapest camcorder at Costco. And I started making Free Kick videos and tutorials. 
and it was very on and off. It was it was just for fun. And then when I got to high school, I stopped. Uh, when I got to university, I stopped for a while because studies really picked up. And then it was right when I got to Austria and I signed the the first deal. That's when I started vlogging the journey in Austria. And at the time, it was actually I was only showing the good moments. And mm. I, like I was only showing the even I didn't want to start vlogging before I actually made it because I noticed a lot of my friends and football people like they would only post when they got signed. They would only post after a good performance. And I picked up on yeah. that. I'm like, I don't want people to know about like the grind or when things go wrong or when I fail. So I got the deal and I started vlogging and I, I did like four or five videos showcasing the journey and everything was cool, positive feedback. And then the injury happened. And then I got into like a dark time. And when I got into that dark time, I stopped making videos. And I think that's when a lot of footballers, when things get difficult, they stop talking to people. They stop making a post. They, they, they stop putting themselves out there, which I think is bad because it actually amplifies everything that you're going through. So back to the content creation, it was very on and off. Then in 2019, I then again did a couple of videos. Things didn't work out in my journey. Stopped making videos. Uh, Instagram, obviously everybody had Instagram at the time, so I was posting occasionally, but 2021 January 1st was when I did the day one of day 365 of trying to sign a pro contract. And that's when I committed every day, I'm going to show part of the process. And that's when I made mm -hmm. the transition to short format content. So on TikTok, and going back to what I just said, the reason I think I was able to be so consistent with it and vulnerable is because nobody was on TikTok at the time. So I was like, if I get on TikTok, people won't really judge me. And I didn't have that top of yeah, mind, yeah. but it was subconscious in my mind. I didn't really want like, you know, I think everybody has thoughts of what do people think of me? There's just different levels to it. And I've now, everything that I've been through, I'm at a level where, you know, I just post and I, and I truly do mm -hmm. what I want to, but we're humans. Like everybody has some level of that. And in 2021, when I started, I did have a level of, oh, what if I make a video and people like judge me for it? Right. So that's why I went to TikTok and I made TikToks every single day because it was people I didn't know. It was a new community. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden people are enjoying it because I'm, now I'm sharing the vulnerable moments. I'm sharing the chronic groin injury. I'm sharing the struggle to try and find a trial. And over time, every day I'm making videos, the followers start picking up. People start tuning into the journey. I see the comments, positive comments. I'm impacting people. They're learning things from me. And then I go to Spain. In Spain, I create the showcase opportunity and I get so much support. And then Spain doesn't really go according to plan and, and I fail. And then, you know, the hate starts coming in. And but I continue. I stay persistent with things every single day. I'm making videos because the goal was to, to achieve the goal. And I did want to show people what it took. I didn't want to ghost just because things got hard. And it was difficult for me mentally at that time because when I started, nobody knew me. I was just on TikTok. It was a new platform. And all the comments were positive. And I think when you start mm -hmm. something like at the beginning, it's always positive. And when you grow mm -hmm. and when you start like stepping into risky territory, that's when people, you know, they start hating on you and they start doubting you and they call you crazy. And that's what happened to me in Spain. And it started messing with my mind a little bit, especially when I then went back to Canada for the winter break and I wasn't able to achieve it in that first year, decided to do a second year. I was supposed to go and make a trial trip happen. Didn't work out because of family health reasons and everybody just hundreds, thousands of hate comments. And I was at a low point in my life. And this was literally like um, 2022, the beginning of the mm -hmm. year. So just over a year, right? And But I, I kept going and I kept making videos and I and I showed the journey of coming to Dubai and, and doing all that. So yeah, that's basically the content creation journey. Then I started uploading things mm. on Instagram. Now I'm doing YouTube vlogs, but it started way back with the YouTube like eight, 10 years ago. And I really wish I actually did short format of those first six to eight years or even long format. Mm. But I had the whole thing in me of like, I didn't want to show the difficult moments. And if people sure. actually saw those difficult moments, there's so much value in that. So I'm glad yeah, like the last yeah, two years yeah. now I was able to put out the 
the setbacks and the challenges and, and people actually get to see what the journey is like. Yeah, no, it's so well said. And it's, it's, it's so much easier to, to talk about than to do, you know, I mean, that's why I always respected, you know, become elite Matt Sheldon and you as well. And just, just sharing those low moments because it's tough. It's tough. And, and those negative comments really could eat away at you, you know, but with that being said, how do you deal with, I don't even know how to, I can't even get the advice on this because I, I have just come to a point where I don't even look at the comments anymore. <laughs> so I'm asking you advice from me, bro. How do, how do you deal with the negative comments? How do you deal with the negativity? Because for me, it's just, it's an emotional roller coaster. It's like, for me, it's like, okay, you know, I'm putting out good vibes and good things into the world, trying to help people and people are just going <laughs> to come at me. So it's like, you know, so, so what's your advice on that? For me, it was very interesting because I was the first person to showcase the process on a platform that is arguably the most toxic platform out of all social media platforms right now. Yeah. If you look at YouTube yeah. and you can go through Become Elite's comments and you can go through a lot of even my own YouTube comments, they're very positive. People are very encouraging. But TikTok mm. just happens to be this platform where people are very toxic and they will hate on you and they will be negative <laughs> and it's crazy. So when it first yeah. happened to me, it was, it was difficult, you know, because my content is about me. A lot of con people who put out content, it's about a topic when it's about a topic and people mm -hmm, hate on mm -hmm. the topic. Okay, cool. Like you're still hating on my content, but it's about a topic. But when people hate on yeah. you, when your content is, it was about me. I was showcasing <laughs> my journey of trying to make a pro. And when I failed and I posted about it, I would have like hundreds of people like make fun of me and laugh at me. Oh, uh, where's your next trial? Seventh division of Bulgaria. Oh, you should give up. Go to the wheelchair <laughs> team. Like the comments are crazy. They're still there, by the way. <laughs> to answer your question of what I did at the beginning, it was very difficult mentally, so I would not reply to it. I would still like see it every once in a while, but after a while, what I would do is like I would post a couple times, and I would post and leave, and I would look at the comments. But I still acknowledged the hate comments every couple of days, and it would eat away at my mind. Then I started flipping the switch. I started taking screenshots mm -hmm. of every single hate comment that got a couple hundred likes. And in my mind, I said, I need these screenshots to go in the documentary in 10 years when I go and climb to yeah. a level that nobody thought I could make it to. So now I have a bunch of screenshots of all these hate comments and they're actually still on the videos. Now, if you go back like a year ago and obviously I still get hate comments every day, but when things externally don't work out, it's amplified. So I have all of those screenshots and basically I'm using those as fuel going back to what we talked about earlier when, when people are doubting yep. you, when people are throwing negative energy at you, can you take that energy and flip it on its head? And for me, it's using it as motivation and fuel. So that's one thing. And number two, I've set up a system now where I actually do still leave after posting. So I'll post something and nine out of 10 times I'll leave and I'll post the next day and I'll post three, four videos in a row. And then after that, Mentally, I'll be like, okay, I'm now going to block out 20 minutes to go through the comments. And if there are hate comments, so be it. And by the way, there's a lot of positivity. And I want to acknowledge everybody who's been supportive for and sure. positive. And, and that is the majority of comments. So I'm so grateful for those people. But every three, four days, I'll look at the comments and I'll do an audit. Okay, what content has helped people? Um, what are people asking about? What are they curious about? Okay, these people are showing love. Amazing. They're like, okay, these people are hating. Mm. Okay, that's cool. And then that's it. And I do my check-in and then I post again for a couple of days and then I come back to it. So it's those two things. One, I just use it as motivation and fuel to drive myself to keep working harder and to, to make something happen that those people never thought was possible. And number two is I just set up a system to keep my mental health in a better place because I do think it's, mm. it's very important to to keep your mental health in, in a good place. And when you are deeply involved in social media, like we are posting almost every single day or every single day, it, it can get to you. So you do have to set up systems sure. into place where you, where you step away from it and you get your mind off of this whole social media game. Absolutely.
Absolutely. I mean, just to go back, I mean, you know, to, to what you said and you're just talking about creating mental Rolodexes and that's Goggins always talks about that. And he just, his recent book, he was talking about where, um, he'll like record like what these people are saying and like, he'll, <laughs> he'll play it yeah. like, like during the day, you know, and his, his wife would hear it at he, the wife would just think he's absolutely insane, but he's like, yeah, you know, that's my fuel. You know, I just, I play the hate and I just replay it. And for me, that's, that's my music. That's my podcast. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we don't have to get so severe, but you know, I think that, that, you know, that, that's a good way to look at it, you know, like we talked about before. And that's also a good thing that you can do with coaches who don't believe in you. You go to a tryout, you know, you get cut or, you know, you're playing on a team, you're sitting on the bench, you think you deserve to be in the 11. You can literally go to your iPhone in your notes app, create your own mental Rolodex, write down all the people that didn't believe in you or, you know, didn't believe in, in your dreams and your goals and every time that you don't want to train or you don't want to give that extra bit and be persistent and keep moving forward, look back at those names. And if, you know, like we talked about before, dark side motivation maybe isn't the healthiest, but if it keeps pushing you forward, you know, it's a good thing to lean on. Obviously, we want that why, like we talked about from the beginning, the deep why to really fuel us and push us forward. But sometimes we need that extra bump. So I think finding creating your own mental Rolodex like that, the system for your mental health is huge. And one thing as well is everyone has a different system. So take what we're talking about and, and take, take other people's advice and create your own system because everyone has a different psychology and works differently. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think overall, you want to be connected to your deep purpose and your why and have that be top of mind the majority of times, and that's going to help you live out the process in a more enjoyable way. But the greats, all the greats, Michael Jordan in his documentary, Kobe, Mamba Mentality, every single of the greatest of the great, Tim Grover in Relentless, he's got this in his book. <laughs> They've got that dark yeah. energy. And the yep. same thing that we talked about the deeper your purpose, the more you're going to be willing to push. The deeper your dark energy, those moments where you do decide to use it, you're going to turn into an animal, an animal. So if we're talking about this right now and you're thinking about it and it's not quite something in your mind, reflect on this because everybody in their journey, there's been people who have doubted them. There's been people who have uh, hated on you, who have who have maybe at times not believed in you, uh, treated you unfairly, whatever that is, you know, as I'm speaking right now, I'm sure people, situations, experiences come to mind. Dig deep into that because the deeper that dark energy is, there's moments where you can activate it. And when you activate it, you're, you're a beast. You're like that clip <laughs> that comes to my mind is it was USA against Spain, I think in the, the Olympics, and it was Kobe going against pa Paul Gasol, I think, and it was the opening play of the match, and he's doing the, he's like standing his ground, and like Gasol hits, like knocks into him, and Kobe knocks him on the ground, and like this guy is not playing, he's not playing. Yeah. Those moments are where greatness happens. So tap into the dark energy; it's super valuable. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that, and. Just, just one more point, you know, to, to, until we move on to how you got to Dubai. I mean, I think one other thing that's very valuable is to have, have a journal, you know, a journal of your, a handwritten journal, write down your thoughts, do, I like to call them mind dumps, get things off your mind, get them onto a page, write that date down. And then you could go back to it and you, you could see how much you've really grown, you know, through your journey. So I think, it, I think. You know, throughout this whole conversation, we just point to football is unbelievable and the the, the self-development and the growth that you get on your journey, whether you're trying to make it to the A team of your club, whether you're trying to play college or whether you're trying to play pro, 
that journey is going to help you throughout the rest of your life. So the number one thing like we talked about is being committed, being persistent, and then using this journey, like so will mention to, to, you know, to learn from and use it as, as a self development process, a metamorphosis. I, I think that, you know, it's really valuable. Yeah. By the way, just as you said that it, I've thought of this before, but it just, it activated in my mind again. And just going back to the whole why, like the purpose behind why I personally do this, a big part of it is because football is this unique opportunity and platform that you're not going to find anywhere else in life that's going to push you to your absolute limits. It's going to push you to your limits and only in those and in, in those end ranges of your limits you're able to tap into these these you know next level versions of persistence and ambition and motivation and drive that you you can't do if you're not doing football and stepping into your discomfort so for mm-hmm. me a big reason i just want to highlight this i actually do pursue football is throw away the medals throw away wanting to play pro it's I constantly want to put myself in that position to see how far am I willing to go? How far am I willing to push myself? And I think I, I've reflected on this a lot in the last two years. I'm like, you know, why? One thing I really don't like about football is actually the fact that certain things are completely out of your control. And there's a lot of career paths in life where the majority of things are in your control. And football is not one of those things. But one thought I had was I actually kind of like that. I like the fact that part of it is uh, there's so much that is in your control in football, but part of it is outside of your control and it creates this beautiful maze, this maze that Mm. sometimes like you don't even know where it's going to take you, but that's the beauty of it. And, and that's another big reason why I do football is, Mm. you know, yes, the parents, yes, the impact, yes, the passion for the game, but it's this beautiful platform that allows that self development to a level that you're not going to get anywhere else. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, just just to add on that, I mean, you know, you're constantly, like you said, you're constantly taking yourself out of your comfort zone. You're constantly pushing the boundaries. And, you know, one thing is life isn't fair, you know, and life is, you know, you can only control so much, so many things. So it's it's, it's a way to learn about life. There, there's ups and downs in everything you do. And like we talk about, you know, through through proper practices, proper habits and proper routines, you can do your best to control yourself. But sometimes there are other things out of your control. And then for me, it's, it's the ability to adapt. You know, Darwin always said it. It's not the strongest. It's not the fittest. But it's the one who has the ability to adapt who's going to survive. And that's what football teaches you. The, the ability to adapt. Because what I've seen, and I'm sure you have, when you go back home, you know, your friends may be working good jobs, making good money, but when they get put in uncomfortable situations, they, they can adapt. So I think at the ability to adapt is one of the, the best qualities that you can have, you know, as, as a human. 100%. Yeah. You become the ultimate adaptation machine. And that's one thing that I think is actually the most valuable thing. Like if you look at everything that comes mm-hmm. under that umbrella, it's the most valuable thing about the beautiful game. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, let, let's take you on to, to the last bit of your journey. How did you how did you make that move to Dubai? Right, so uh, zooming out a bit, had the time in Austria, then came back to Canada, uh, wanted to go CPL. Again, the whole out of the control, spoke to certain agents, false promises. Ended up playing League One Ontario, um, the division lower, then took another risk to go to Austria, signed with a great team, great setup with Wacker Innsbruck 2, was planning to go to the first team in the summer, and then COVID hits. And all of a sudden, I worked mm-hmm. incredibly hard for this opportunity, and COVID hits, and the league gets suspended, and the contract gets cut, and now I'm back. I'm back to square one, and now I'm documenting the journey from, from square one, I have the opportunity to go to Spain. Spain, I do the showcase. Showcase doesn't work out. Um, I then end up signing with a team. And I have half a season there. Didn't like the setup because the level was not where I wanted it to be. Slash, I didn't see 
a, a roadmap to work my way up because Spain is incredibly competitive. And unless you're yeah. on a team in a lower division that is, you know, well known in the community or is doing well in the league, you're not really going to be able to move up or it's going to take a long amount of time. So I decided to, I had the opportunity. It was crazy actually, like, because I'm also in the content creation space. And this is where I like to highlight what we talked about earlier is having different passions and interests and skills can actually help you out in football as well. I got invited to an event in Abu Dhabi and we had a bye weekend. So we didn't play that weekend and it was perfect. And I decided to take the trip out. I had the Abu Dhabi event and then I had two days I decided to go to Dubai. Everybody said, you got to go to Dubai. I go to Dubai and I said, I'm in Dubai. Might as well check out football here. So I tap into my network. A guy from Spain links me up with a club called Porsan Hispania. I go train with them and the training session goes well. They want me back for 10 days. And that's when I already have my return to Spain book. So I said, listen, second half of the season, I'm interested to come here, do the 10 day training with you guys and see where that takes me. And I came back, family health issues, the, the new variant of COVID hit, arguably the most difficult time of my life, just because of the, the relationship with the family. And then thankfully, when that started getting a little bit better, that's when I decided to go to Germany. Austria had a couple of weeks there because the Dubai opportunity mm -hmm. fell through because I couldn't go at that time because of the family thing. So I went to Germany, Austria, try and make it happen. Had a couple of weeks there and then found out that I couldn't sign until a specific uh, window opened up in the summer. So it mm -hmm. was either I stay in Europe and just train with teams until I can sign or I explore Dubai. And that's when I said, one-way ticket, hit up every club in Dubai, and let's get myself a trial opportunity there. And that's what I did. Mm. Unreal, bro. Unreal. So so take us through that. So how many clubs did you, did you go to in Dubai? And then, you know, when, when did you land on, on Golf United? So pretty much hit up every single club I could. I remember I was looking up the, the region. I was looking up different clubs, and I hit up pretty much all the clubs I could find. Golf United got back to me. I connected with the sporting director and he said, look, we'll have you out of training. If you do well, you can keep training. If you don't, goodbye. And I took the risk. So I took the, the one way, booked myself an Airbnb. I remember I got to the airport, you know, never really talked about this, but, and this is just one of those many, many moments like this that just hasn't been shared because you can't share mm. everything, <laughs> but, um, so what was the date here of this? Uh, this so this is, this is literally like a, a bit over a year now that I come to Dubai Okay. and, and I come and basically the thing I just want to mention, cause it's, it's just for me that moment, it just, it's special. I came to, I remember I came to the airport mm -hmm. and I was so hesitant on like, Yo, do I get an Uber to my Airbnb? I, I was checking the the Kareem. There's an app called Kareem, and it was like a hundred dirhams, okay, which mm -hmm. isn't a lot of money, but it's just my mindset and the years of grinding and and being so disciplined with my finances and trying to take on opportunities. I was at the airport. I'm like, do I take this Uber? I was doing the math. I remember like it was late at night to uh, training, not the next day, but the day after. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what am I doing? So then I I start looking at car rentals. And I'm like, would it make more sense to like get a car rental in terms of money? And I went to every single car rental and, and I got the cheapest option at the time. And, and that was just, it was just a special moment for me to make the commitment to get a car rental because it sounds weird, but being so disciplined with finances for years and years and years, and then finally making a decision to kind of step a little bit outside of what you typically do like i would typically only take the local bus or like just try and get a ride from somebody but finally you know i got a car rental so long story short i take the car rental out to the airbnb and no but that that yeah. mean that you know yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt you but that that shows it was a higher level of thinking you know what yeah. i mean higher level of consciousness it shows that you believed in yourself and in, in essence it was a and, and, and manifestation, you know, manifesting what was going to happen. That's true. It's true. And also another big part of that was I knew for the first time, I think it was an evolution. We just talked about this is 
there's something outside of football. So I knew if I got myself that car rental, training's going to be three hours, right? I go to training, I train for two hours, I come back. But the other hours in the day, I knew if I had that car, I could go and make connections in the city because I was so committed to making Dubai happen. And that's what I actually did my first two weeks of training with the club. I would do the training, but then after, and Dubai is a city where if you don't have a car, you can't really get around. There's a metro, but it's very difficult. It's not like mm-hmm. Europe. And so every single day, I would take the car to somewhere. And I would I would take it to a company and try and make a connection. I would take it to, I would message people, like DM people in the city, set up a coffee meeting with them, take it out to a cafe and meet somebody new. And I did that every single day to try and grow my network in a city where I had absolutely no connections at the time of coming. Now, over mm-hmm. a year later, it's massive. Like, uh, it's incredible mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the people I know and, and what the city offers. But yeah, back to the football. So I do the trial there. And this is crazy, okay? This is, again, the first time I'm sharing this on a podcast. A week and a half into the trial, it's going well. I'm performing well. And basically, our coach is Steven Taylor, okay? Well, my coach mm-hmm. now, but at the time, he wasn't my coach. He was the team's coach. And he is a Newcastle United legend. And Newcastle United, there was a international week, and they had come down to Dubai to do their one-week uh, camp in the heat, right? And they had set up a game against my club, exhibition game, but behind closed doors, so not open for media. And because this game is a friendly match, you can have anybody play in it. You don't need to be registered in the UAE FA. So... The plan was to get me involved in this match because they want to see how I play. And bro, they had, uh, what's his name? Maxime, St. Maxime. They had, uh, oh, they, bro, they had their first team players at this game. But keep in mind, yeah. okay? So this all sounds hype, but here's, again, where the massive setback comes. Two days before we play Newcastle United, we're doing this uh, game and training. And I go up and I'm an animal, bro. Like, I want this Dubai thing so badly. I remember it was like the <laughs> last five minutes of training and I'm going all out. We're doing this game. It's tied 1-1. I'm like, my team needs to win this. I, I'm a, I was playing center attacking mid in that game. And the ball was on the opposite side. So their striker mm-hmm. was about to go in for a volley. I run back. I jump in the air to try and flick the ball away before he can complete his volley. <laughs> his leg follows yeah. through with my body knocks me off balance in the air i land on my ankle and basically terrible ankle injury physio after a couple weeks lets me know it was a grade three sprain very close to a full-on rupture but thankfully it didn't full-on rupture and no opportunity against newcastle united so i I missed out on the match and only the selected players could attend the match because it was behind closed doors so i didn't even get to watch the match and yeah, I was out for a couple of weeks, didn't train with the team. The conversation at the time was, listen, we saw you. We like what we saw. Let's discuss bringing you into preseason. So I knew I had that opportunity. But um, that's basically how it went down. Then went back to Canada. Uh, had to recover the ankle, which was a lot worse than I mm. thought it was. And mm. after a bunch of recovery, came back into what I thought would be a preseason invite, but turned out to be a closed trial invite because the demand was so high to get into the club. So Mm -hmm. they had open tryouts throughout the summer and in total they had 700 people come throughout three different trials. And then after the open tryout, they had a closed trial. And this was players they already knew, players who had played high levels and a select few from the open trials. And that's when I Mm -hmm. went in with 100 players that first week and the whole thing's on, on TikTok and YouTube. But that first week, eight players got selected to move into first team training with uh, the first team, uh, first week of preseason. And then every Mm. week they would trim off players, add new players. And every week I grinded and I grinded. And after a couple of weeks, signed the contract uh, and Mm -hmm. kickstarted the season, which what a what a crazy season it has been. And and Mm. it's so nice, bro, ending it with uh, a medal and lifting the trophy yeah. especially when you're yeah. when you have years of things not working out and never winning something like i'm just going to be straight up with everybody like when you don't win something for years and years and then finally you win something that's the moment that that moment is what we've been talking about this whole conversation of 
if you're not yeah. going to push through all the no's and all the failures and all the setbacks and all the times it got really, really difficult and those difficult questions start popping into your mind of, do I want to continue this? Do I want to get up today and train? If you're not willing to get yourself out there on the field and keep being consistent with things, those moments you're not going to experience. And every single person has multiple of those moments in their journey. And I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. grateful to have had this one moment, which I've had great moments before, but it's, it's really nice lifting a trophy and getting the promotion. So it, it's been yeah. a really nice year, which has had its obstacles and challenges. And I think that's going to happen with any team and any season and any part of anybody's journey. But to end it off with a promotion and lifting the trophy, uh, I'm, I'm really happy with it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's unbelievable, man. I mean, you know, you took us through this whole journey, you know, getting, getting cut from a university team, going to, you know, another university team, you know, that was lower. You thought you'd be the best player there. That didn't work out. You go to Austria, you know, the whole, the whole journey is incredible. I mean, you almost risked your life, you know, going over that, uh, that highway <laughs> and, you know, I mean, dude, I mean, it's, you know, it's incredible. And, uh, like you said, from the beginning, we sum it up, it's persistent. So, you know, with all that being said, through the season, um, what what are the top three things that you learned that you're going to take into the next season and that you would pass on to some youngsters listening based off of the whole journey you've been on, what you've learned, and then throughout this season, getting into, into you know, the first league in the UAE? One of the big things I learned is that preparation and discipline is incredibly important. And I'll be a bit more specific with this. What I did coming into preseason and with my trials and in the season, I'm not going to lie. I had, I had ups and downs with this because once you, you kind of, your things are good. Things are good. That's when the discipline comes, dies down. And that's when mentally you have to be very sharp and get yourself back up and keep the foot on the gas pedal. But for me, every single night, I would go to sleep early before, like, visualizing my... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah all my good, bad. yeah. AirPods just died. But I would basically be... No worries. ...my performance the following day. I would be... I would have resistance bands out on my couch. Like, I would have a couch with mm. resistance bands. I would be working my ankle eversion inversion rotations i would be doing glute bridge like every single muscle i would activate i would play music to like start picturing like what am i going to do tomorrow shut down early i would make sure like all my clothes are out on the floor i i i'm picturing it right now like my clothes were on the floor i had my hydration my electrolyte drink was made in the fridge that level of preparation that is incredibly useful in a setting where you are stepping in for a trial for a preseason where you are needing to be in your top condition. And I do think consistently doing that is, is very useful. But for me, that was one big highlight. Number two, I would say this is a, and this is a unique one. This is a unique one. And this is something that I knew, but now after the season, my realization has grown. And you're, I know you're fully aware of this, and it's what 99.9% .9 of people who are stepping into high-level football are not aware of. And it's any environment that you step into, there's players who will have advantages and players who will have disadvantages. And those players who have advantages, what I mean by that is they know somebody from the club. They have a connection. They have a football agent. They have a previous conversation with the club about what that season's gonna go like. They have, a, they have a previous agreement about maybe an idea of how much playing time they're gonna get. They, they have an advantage going into that environment. And what I learned is my whole career, uh, the majority of my career, I've always been the guy because I haven't had a network, haven't had a connection. It's always been, I gotta grind to get myself into an environment. Now what I'm taking into next season is how can I be the player who has the advantage? Because there's never going to be an equal environment in any football environment. It's straight up. There's never going to be a fully equal environment. There's going to be players who mm -hmm. have the advantage, players who don't have it. 
And I felt like I've always been on the, the opposite end of I haven't had the advantage. And now moving into next season, one big learning point for me is how can I create an environment where whether it's it's a specific football agent, it's a previous verbal agreement that I've had with the coaching staff, it's whatever that is, I know I'm coming in, I know there's some level of greater trust and belief and want in me being in that environment. So that's mm -hmm. point number two. I want to highlight is how can you create that environment for yourself where you have an advantage? And based off of my years of experience, it's being closer to the coaching staff. I, I really think that's what it comes down to. And then obviously there's deeper levels of, of what that closeness is and what the conversations are. But that's my second learning point. And the third learning point I will say is, I would say it's, this season, I, I did something different. What I did differently is, uh, there's two things that come to mind. One, I will quickly highlight because it's what we talked about earlier. It's getting my mind off of football. It's doing the things dur during my day, the, the interests, the passions, doing things to get my mind off of football. That's one learning experience I had this year. The other one was taking my injury prevention to the next level, starting to do a lot of fascia work. St there's this whole thing about, just do fascia, just do gym work. Why not combine mm -hmm. the two? Exactly. Why not combine the two? So I've been doing a lot of fascia uh, work. I'm in the gym, loading my muscles. I'm doing the eight uh, knees over toes. I'm taking the injury prevention a lot more seriously. And this is the first season where we had a friendly match against the U23s of Saudi Arabia, where I had an ankle sprain. It had me out for a week and a half. But apart from that, the majority of the season, I was healthy. So taking injury mm. prevention to the next level, that's a big love learning that. point I had this year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love all those points. I mean, I, I'd like to touch on all of them. So, so the first thing, obviously, is what I always try to tell you, and I, I do myself as well, is, you know, setting yourself up properly the night before the next day is, is critical. You know, because everyone wants to have a great day and want to have a good morning routine. But if you don't set yourself up the night before, you know, from a from a tangible perspective with all your 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 gear, from a mental perspective and from a physical perspective, the day is not going to go great. So I think taking that nighttime routine seriously is huge. And then the main reason also with that is when you wake up, you don't have as many uh, thoughts of you know, uh, everything's prepared for you. So you don't have to do, there's no decision making. It's like, okay, everything's laid out, boom. Uh, and, and one thing I want to point out as well is people always try to ask me, how, how do I stretch more? How do I get better at injury prevention? Make it open to the eye. Keep that stuff, you know, because as with everything, you know, if you have the mat out rather than rolled up in the corner, it might take 15 seconds to unroll that mat. But if it's out, your, your mind, it's already in the subconscious. So it's like, I got to get my stretching and breath work, injury prevention. So I think that's huge, number one. And then number two, uh, probably one of the biggest things is what, what people don't see on social media and they don't see on TV is that back end, what's going on, you know, behind the scenes with the players, with the club. So if you could get yourself on the good side of that, you know, you're, you're, in, you're in good hands. And, um, yeah. And, and then number three, like you talked about with the injury prevention work, people don't see the, those, the reps that you put in on those small stabilizer muscles. They don't see the tedious movements, the boring movements, the stretching that may be boring. But honestly, when you get further into your career, those are the thing that, those are the things that's going to prolong your career. Because I think what we all want is longevity. You know, it's good to play, you know, maybe one, two years, but if you could play 10, 15 years at a high level, that that's that's the goal. So I think, you know, focusing on all those things that So Hill touched on are, you know, incredible. Yeah, 100%. And one other thing that just came to my mind, which I've implemented this season, and I've noticed it made a significant difference. And I don't think a lot of people do this. It's before a training session or a game, you actually, you, you prime your mind, not just the mental side, but also physically for that performance. So what 
I'll get into like what I actually do. So before a training session, I don't always do this, but the majority of training sessions, I try and make this happen. I do an extended warm up on my own. And if I can, I try and get on the ball. Like, yo, just by being on the ball for like five minutes before actually going in with your team, I personally, I become so much more confident because I'm great on the ball. I'm a great dribbler. But sometimes like when I'm just doing dynamic warm up, and then all of a sudden we get into team training, just because I haven't had like a couple of minutes of, of playing with the ball, I don't unlock my full potential. So I've done that before games, before training sessions, just get on the ball a little bit by yourself. I do an extended warm up move oftentimes like bro i would before i remember before trials especially i feel like in the change room just like static and that's when like all that anxious energy and the thoughts come in like yep. nowadays we go and have a league game and people are like some people are sitting in the change room i get up i go i, I walk around the field i feel the grass i try and i try and move i try and prime my mind for performance so that's another thing i included this mm. season which i've noticed has improved my performance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, whatever you can do to, to, to accommodate yourself to the atmosphere and make yourself feel more comfortable is just massive. Because like Sohil touched on before, what I want, I forgot exactly what the point was, but no matter who you are, whether, whether you're, you know, the, the best player in the world, you know, we all, we're all humans. We all have problems. It's not like everyone gets butterflies. Everyone gets nerves before games. But if you can find your own, and I know people, you know, make fun of pregame rituals. And, but for me, it's like if you could find that, that, that thing that makes you perform your best, do it. And, and, and who cares? And also what I wanted to touch on in the human performance space is so well touched on, on all these great guys that, that are teaching good things, whether it be, you know, whether it's traditional strength and conditioning, whether it's, you know, uh, knees over toes guy, whether it's the fascial stuff. Training, training in life doesn't have to be so black and white. Take the best things and make, create your gray area. You know, it's not, it's not like the, this football entangled, like you're going to go into the woods and create, you know, a Neymar because you're grounding. Like everyone always asks me about football entangled, like, some of the stuff he says there is pretty good, like the grounding, the sun, the nutrition, but like some of the stuff is absurd. So it's like kind of, you know, one thing that I also want to touch on, you know, I know it's getting late, but it's like, you got to filter out the BS, you know, cause there's a lot of BS. There's a lot of overwhelm on social media. So I think you got to take, take advice from people who are at the place you want to be or who have worked with, the highest level players who are doing well, you know? So it's like, try to filter it out and, and kind of come into your own common ground, take bits and pieces from everyone and implement it to your own life. Because for me, you know, I love David Goggins, but I'm not, you know, going to do all his stuff. You know, I love Jocko Willink. I take those bits and pieces, you know? So, so it's about creating, you know, what you said there is creating your own, environment whether it be socially or, or pre-game pre-training that's going to make you perform your best by the way the biggest thing that has made an impact in my life is because you you mentioned journaling earlier in this conversation and when you brought it up i wanted to add something to that because as a tool i think that's actually been the most useful thing i implemented in my life two reasons one it's the mental dump Two, it's a combination of either reflecting on your day, looking at what worked, what didn't work, or planning, looking forward, setting intentions for the upcoming day. That's a tool, but one thing that has made the biggest impact in my life is opening myself up to new information and perspectives. And I've done that through podcasts and books. This started in, in 2019, going to 2020. And just to touch on what you just said about Things don't have to be black and white. Look at people in the space who have done it at the highest level. Look at all their work. And there's going to be pieces that you can take from each person. Bring those pieces together and implement that into your life. And if I didn't get into podcasts and self-development and open up my mind to new strategies, new perspectives, new ideas, I would not even be close to where I am 
today. So that's a big thing I would also recommend every football player or anybody else listening to this. Get, I mean, if you're listening to this, by the way, you're already in the space, right? You're listening to a great podcast. But I would encourage you to keep listening to podcasts, keep reading books. And like you said, take the pieces from each of those people with high level experience, combine it and then add it to your own life. Because that's been mm -hmm, the number mm -hmm. one thing for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one more thing before we end off, just to, to clarify it and, and just, you know, add to what you said is, you know, you don't have to agree with every single thing that someone says to, to take their methods and put it to use. Joe Rogan talked about it the other day. He was like, with my good friends, I don't agree with every single thing that they say, you know, that's what makes a good friendship debate, challenging each other, learning off each other. So wh whoever it is, I would try to find someone like Solo said and, and find those people who you, you agree with the majority of the things they say, you know, and, and, and you find that, but you're not going to agree with every single thing. People say outlandish things because it's worked for them or other people. But I think the moral of the story is test things, experiment, and, and try to find, you know, your own routine. Yeah, I agree. Early on, I think the more things you try, the more experiences you get into, the, the quicker you're also going to find those skills and the passions and the interests that we talked about. So looking back at my 16, 15, 17, 18, I was very one dimensional. I would not put myself into new conversations into new experiences. And that's something I wish I did a lot more of. So test, try, mm. taste things, because the more of that you do, the quicker and the better you will get at the thing you're most passionate about and the thing you're most skilled at. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. Let, let's end it there, man. I just, uh, you know, if you want to tell the people who don't know you where to follow you, Maybe, you know, if you have any exciting news coming up, any new projects you're working on that you want to share, you know, with the audience, feel free. For sure. So best place to follow is at Sohel.var, S-O-H-E-I-L dot V-A-R. Instagram, TikTok, on YouTube, I'm starting to do consistent long format vlogs. So that's where you get to see more of the behind the scenes of my life. So I'm really excited about that. And the other thing is, we have a free football community. It's called the Insider Football Community. Uh, link is in my bio, Discord chat. It's all about making a positive impact, helping each other out, growing your football network around the world. So those are two things. And bro, thank you so much for having me on. And course, thank bro. you for having this platform because me, when I was younger, this is what I wish I had. I wish I had something where I could go to someone who's been through it and they actually share it and they share it in, in such a great way where you have podcasts, you do your videos. I know you do your training and your courses and all that. So I just want to acknowledge that like you're doing an amazing job and the work that you're putting out is making like these impacts in all of these players lives that are on the come up and it will allow them to live their career a lot more fulfilled and happy and at the same time push for a higher level. But I think that that piece of living it a lot more fulfilled and happy, it's so valuable. And I, I really want to acknowledge that. So, so great stuff. Thank Appreciate you that. Number. Appreciate that, man. Look forward to connecting sometime soon in person, man. I got to make my way out to Dubai. That's for sure. You're always welcome. <laughs> All right, brother. Thanks so much, man. Have a great rest of the night. You too, brother. All right, brother.